we've absorbed our salt water mixture and we've decided that what we're seeing is a homogeneous mixture. So, uh, if you have something truly dissolved, you're going to have a homogeneous mixture. Um, and then what we do to decide how to separate a mixture is consider the physical properties of the components of the mixture. So, what kind of physical properties do you know about water that might be different than the physical properties of salt? Water evaporates. Water evaporates, the salt evaporates. So, like you've learned probably in physical science that the water in the ocean is salt water, but when water evaporates from the ocean, it's just the water that evaporates. It doesn't carry away the salt and other things dissolved in it when it evaporates. Um, so when we boil this, light to match, get it boiling. You left the match box underneath the table. Okay. Put on goggles. Just are all done. We can separate the mixture based on its physical properties. Water's boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. Um, the melting point of salt oof, <laughs> is 700 degrees Celsius. So when we boil this water, the salt's not even going to be anywhere near melting, much less boiling. So the physical difference that we are using to separate this mixture is the difference in melting point and boiling point. So here, let's get a red or something. I'm going to write BP for boiling point. From now on, I will always write BP for boiling point because I will write the word boiling point like 6,000 times this year. the melting point of salt memorized, but it's really close to 700 Celsius. Wow. So we can safely assume that the water is going to boil away dry at a, just a little over 100 degrees because salt water actually has a slightly higher boiling point than fresh water. Um, and yet the salt will be absolutely solid, still not even melted, much less boiled away. So we shouldn't lose any of the salt, except for right at the end, one of the sources of error we might see would be that when the water is really boiling and there's only a small amount, it might actually throw some of the salt like out of the beaker physically. So that could happen. So let's go back to our worksheet here. So we've rinsed the salt and sand through the filter, collected the sand in the filter, we've got salt water and we're going to boil it until is absolutely dry, then the water will have gone away. Remember, we're going qualitatively with respect to water, so we don't care how much water that is. We just want to get rid of it, which could take forever since I used so much. And then we're going to measure the mass of the beaker and salt residue. We know the mass of the beaker. We can find the mass of the salt residue. We can see if we got it all. If that was an effective way to separate this mixture, by using the coffee filter. And we'll find our percent error then. So while that boils away, I'm going to move my chair over here, so it's my hair on fire, and so I can still see it just in case disaster strikes, and we will talk about it. So here are our <coughs> questions. Let's see. Um, who haven't I talked to a whole lot? Jolene. Okay. Uh, why was this method chosen to separate the mixture of sand and salt? It takes so too long to pick through. What? It takes too long to pick through. It would take too long to pick through. Picking through the sand and salt with a tweezer sounds like a bad plan. Um, what is different? What physical properties did we compare when we chose to uh, um, dissolve and filter the salt? The color. Um, the color. Um, Colors. Okay, so if we had chosen the other method, we would have picked colors, right? We would have pulled the brown ones here and the white ones here and hoped that we had separated it. But if we chose the filtration method, what physical property of sand makes it not pass through the filter? Size. 
Okay, salt has little pieces, sand has big pieces. They stay in the coffee filter and the salt, the, the salt can pass through the filter. Um, also, the physical property that sand does not dissolve in water and salt does dissolve in water, which I hope is up there. So, mostly that blue answer at the very top of the board is essentially what you want to write in here. Sand does not dissolve in water, salt does dissolve in water, sand will not pass through a coffee filter because its pieces are large, salt that is dissolved has very tiny pieces that do fit right through the holes in the coffee filter and go through. Alright, it's boiling away, the wire gauze is blazing red. Toward the end, I'll need to turn the heat down, so if you hear spitting and I don't, let me know. Make sure you fill in number one. Oh, this is where I graded these and it kept going awry. Just open the window.
qualitatively. Qualitatively. We did not measure the quantity of sand. We just used some. Uh, with respect to salt. Quantitative. Hopefully we'll have the same quantity of salt at the end that we did at the beginning, although you never know. It usually works very well, actually, so hopefully we're good. And mica. If a mixture of two liquids with different boiling points needed to be separated, like alcohol and water. And so alcohol has a boiling point of about 70 Celsius and water about 100 Celsius. Uh, how might I separate the mixture? Uh, well, basically kind of what we would do with um, the salt and the water. How salt has 700 degrees Celsius as the boiling point. So we would heat it to 70 degrees Celsius and boil off the alcohol and leave the water behind. Brilliant. Do you and know? then if you wanted to, you could cool it down into a separate um, beaker. Right, and that's actually a process called distillation. Um, and I don't have the equipment to do it very well. I mean, you can do it with like a pot lid and bag rip it off. And yeah, bag of ice. Um, but uh, there's a beautiful lab set up for distillation with a nice column and you run cold liquid through the column. So uh, what you do is you take your alcohol and your water or any two liquids with a fairly good solid difference in boiling point. You make sure you get a thermometer or some way to read the temperature in there and then you bring it up and so the lower boiling point liquid starts to boil away and then it goes up into the column as a vapor, uh, gets into the part where the cold liquid's passing through and that cools it down back into a liquid so it can drip out into another container. And then you monitor the temperature. Uh, and you know that during the phase change, no temperature change will occur. So the entire time, I know all eyes are on the beaker that is making little noises. Um, Kristen back up. <laughs> uh, so the um, temperature will stay the constant boiling point of the lower boiling point liquid the entire time that it is having a phase change. And the moment that you see it start to rise, assuming that you're mixing it well, you know that all of that liquid has boiled away, you shut it off, pull this out before any contaminants can come through, and you've got your one liquid collected, your other liquid has hopefully had, and then you can go a little further once you pull your, your first liquid out, then you can boil off some that you know is contaminated until it gets up to the boiling point of the other liquid, then you know all that's left is the higher boiling point liquid in this side, the lower boiling point liquid in this side, and you've separated that mixture. You have to waste a little bit in the middle just to be on the safe side. If you do that two or three times, you get something that is pretty confidently pure. Um, so you can definitely separate based on boiling point. That's a physical property because we know that phase change, like boiling, freezing, melting, those are physical changes. Uh, it doesn't rearrange the chemical bonds. It's just a physical way to separate a mixture. Uh, so what physical property were we comparing to choose a way to separate them? Boiling. boiling point. Those two liquids have a different boiling point. That's the physical property we use to decide how to separate them. So, when I was a kid, breakfast cereal, uh, people were really obsessed over people not getting up enough iron in their diet. And you would find breakfast cereals is like 175% <laughs> of your daily allowance of iron. Um, when you eat iron in a food source, like this is actual food meant to be food, like not breakfast cereal, but like a plant that grows in nature or an animal that once lived in nature, if you get your iron from like beef or spinach, um, it is an iron atom, maybe ion, that is um, part of a biological molecule and your body has mechanisms to use that iron that is part of a biological molecule. Um, if you just have some iron filings, like, oh, I was cutting an iron pipe and now there's shavings on the floor, um, and you consume those, your body isn't really going to be able to utilize that iron as part of, you know, your blood to carry oxygen around, for example. Um, but, somehow, People thought that just packing your cereal full of, quite literally, iron filings was a great idea to get iron into your body so that you would not be iron deficient. Uh, 
this experiment does not work as well today as it did when I was a kid because the cereal only has 90% at most of your daily allowance of iron. Uh, and you really have to crush the heck out of it because they actually put the iron filings into the dough. So if you don't crush it beyond, like, into the tiniest of particles, it's really hard to get the iron filings out of the dough enough that they're attracted to where's my magnet. And I have two samples of cereal. Last year we actually did get some uh, iron filings out of our cereal. And you see a yellow magnet. Oh, we're getting close. Maybe I'll turn our temperature down a little bit. definitely see residue now. So, if I know that I have breakfast cereal that potentially could contain iron filings, how might I separate the mixture of cereal from iron? Use the magnet to attract to the iron. Okay, so what physical property am I using to separate the mixture? The magnetism of the iron. Right, and the breakfast cereal is not magnetic. Uh, magnetic uh, without it's iron filings in it. Uh, so hopefully we can find some. So take a look at my magnet. Make sure it doesn't have any residual iron filings clinging to it because last year in my physics class, they discovered some really cool stuff with magnets, but they made a mess. It took me forever to pry every little iron filing off of my magnet. I usually don't let them make such a mess and just experiment, but we had time, and they really definitely learn some stuff. Alright, so you four can confirm for me that we're good. Drop her in. And I'll scooch it around. Yeah, don't film this. I don't have a lot of confidence that I'm going to actually be able to get some iron filings out of this cereal. But last year it worked, so who knows. Alright, so iron filings are black. We'll be able to identify my magnets, not the cleanest, but all my other magnets are quite literally black. So, maybe we'll take the back of my lab sheet here and try to dust off what we've got. Wow, there's like a giant chunk of something. Was this giant chunk of something there before? fun. We have a very large black and apparently magnetic thing that was in our breakfast cereal. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> and, yeah, please start baking your own bread. Oh, it won't even come off. I'm pretty sure that that is, yeah. Yep, that's an iron filing right there. Yes, it is huge. I've never gotten one that big. Let's see if any of these little guys come or if they're just dust. No, I didn't get anything but that guy. Let's check out the other. So this was uh, wheat checks. Just in case anyone wants to know for sure what you're eating. Boycott checks. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get a film of our ginormous iron filing? I can't believe that. I've never seen something that big come out of cereal before. That's a little freaky. That is a little freaky. That's a big one. What kind of This is Frosted Mini Wheat Target brand. Have you ever uh, tried cereal? No, because they only have like, I don't know, 25% of the iron. Oh. So my chances are less ideal with Cheerios. These both had 90% of our daily value of iron, daily value, meaning, uh, so we can definitely separate a mixture, Let's see if I can get any iron off of this, looks like mini wheats are pretty safe, no, that might be a, do you think that's a little chunk right there? Mm, yeah. Yeah, okay, we got one little guy. I might have lost him. Boy, them too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not 
not as bad, though. No. Although, who knows, if I crushed up the whole box, what we'd find. But... There's one right here, maybe. No, no just some other <laughs> contaminant. Awesome. So if I wave this around, we've definitely picked up at least three pretty good-sized pieces, which I think all came from the Wheat Checks. That was brand name Wheat Checks, not off-brand Wheat Checks. <laughs> Just so we're clear on to the comfort of that. not be iron deficient, I think. Unless you can't absorb anything. Yeah, a little disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save that for just they saw some last year, but nothing like that. Crazy. Okay, oh, where's that piece of paper? I need to press that out. Alright, so we'll need to know. You can see salt residue, which hopefully none flies out of the beaker, but it probably will. So, number six says, if a mixture of breakfast cereal and iron filings needs to be separated, how might you accomplish this? Use a magnet, and um, the breakfast cereal itself is not magnetic, the iron filings are. And just think, like, I didn't, I mean, I didn't use a food processor and crush this super thoroughly, so there could be more trapped in there. Yeah, we have 
have salt, but possibly very contaminated salt. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let that cool a little bit before we measure its mass, just so my scale doesn't suffer. Uh, this is leaking and <coughs> sticky. So would someone grab a tissue that I don't see to anymore? This one? Sure. Would someone grab a tissue from back there so we can save everyone's hands from touching this? Thank you. All right, so if you pass this around, uh, you are welcome to take the lid off, but not near your lab partner's calculator. Filling vinegar in your calculator is bad. Um, <laughs> this is my first night project. Like this oh. So, you um, remove the shell using an acid base reaction that's different than just breaking the shell. Breaking the shell is a physical change, but what do we have here? Yeah, you can take them off now that the burner's off. Oh, it's only been a day, basically, so um, it's not quite as removed as one might hope. But did we remove the shell using chemical or physical changes? Uh, chemical. Chemical changes. The egg had a little red stamp, which is why there's that red stuff in there. <laughs> it was one of the good eggs. Okay. So. They're also bouncy. <laughs> yes. Anyone who desperately wants to touch it can do it at the end of class when you go wash your hands. Okay. My birthday. Oh. Oh. So is that like clean water? Yeah. No, it's a chemical reaction between the vinegar and the calcium carbonate shell, which is an acid base yeah, reaction. Yeah, took that and then you put it in corn syrup, it shrink. This is true. Once you remove the shell, then you can do the osmosis experiment because the little, uh, one of the parts of the egg we didn't talk about is that the membrane. membrane. And that's right, you guys have all had biology already. Um, or probably all of you. Um, and the membrane allows water to pass and certain things to pass and most things to not pass, like the contents of the egg. You shall not And so you can experiment with that and it's all kinds of fun. Okay. So, if you want to like take the egg and like dump on for like that, I did that. It definitely will break if you're not sure we're done. As Liam sadly found out, it was not me. It was fun. All right, I'm gonna burn the table for my hand here. So, let's find the mass and find the mass of the salt by difference. So it's a zero, it's a one. What do we have?
would have gotten more of the salt that was stuck in the sand, dissolved in water, and passed through. So I should have done that definitely. And that probably would have reclaimed some more of the salt. Uh, what other source? It could have boiled out. It could have splattered. It splattered. And there's definitely like little particles of salt all around here. So we did lose some to spattering. Probably mostly we lost it to not rinsing the sand thoroughly. So those are our two main sources of error. And we're supposed to find our percent error, which is going to be embarrassing at this point. So percent error is the accepted value, so that's the mass of the salt to start with, minus the experimental value, the amount of salt we found at the end that we had left, 2.09, divided by the accepted value, what we had at the beginning. Right, and this is an absolute value. In case somehow we had managed to have sand with enough dust that could pass through that we'd actually gotten a bigger number than this, we'd have negative error. So you use the absolute value, so your error is just how far from true you are, one way or the other, not negative or positive. Times 100%. And I three cringe. Right? You can keep three because all of our measurements okay. have three. So you would get 9.91%. Actually, no, that's not true. You can't keep three. Because when you subtract and then you change from adding and subtracting to multiplying and dividing, you have to round. So you do 2.32 minus 2.09. And that would give you 0 0.23 grams, and you would round there, and that's only two. So we can only keep two at the end. No, I mean 8.6%. I got 9.9. .9. Yeah. I got 9.9. .9. That was my previous answer. I got 0.23 divided by 2.32 times 100. I get 9.9%. Which, under 10%, they say is pretty good with a Jimmy Rick lab and low tech equipment. Uh, usually we have like a 2% error, so we usually get really, really close on this. But I clearly, I didn't rinse the sand well and get all the salt out of it. So that I think that's our big source there. Um, so everyone filled in your lab sheet. Yes. Good. Next week you'll write a lab report about separating mixtures. We'll separate a different mixture next week. Actually, we're going to separate this mixture right here. Um, and so you'll get to talk about how you choose physical properties that are very different between the things in the mixture um, in that lab report. So hopefully you make good notes today. How much time do I have left? Not a ton. All right. So let's look at review questions. Ah, I'll tell you about those in a minute. Did I think this week you didn't do any balancing chemical equations, right? No, no. Okay, so, oh, I do need to tell you a few details about that. Um, so, next week, your reading will include balancing chemical equations, and he only gives you, like, I don't know, 10 total practice ones, but it's something we're going to do all year, and you've got to master. So... I gave you extra practice. And I'll send you a link to check your answers once you finish them, but don't cheat. Do it and then check them. Lily. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I'm not getting this. I mean, I think I need numbers. Though. You need parentheses. So you'll have to do. Oh, that times by one, times literally by a hundred. Um. <coughs>
When you do percent error, you actually times by 100. Not 100 percent, like whereas always the percent by doing the decimals, like multiply by literally 100. Um, so here are two things you need to know. Because the problems on the worksheet are a little more challenging than the problems that you will see in the book, but it will get you ready for the harder things you can throw at you later in the year. So, two things you need to know. So, calcium carbonate, like our eggshell, right? How many calcium atoms are in one molecule of calcium carbonate? One calcium. How about how many carbon? One. one. And how many oxygen? Three. Three. So when you balance equations, uh, let's say we've got calcium carbonate. Well, vinegar is this. You saw this reaction today, removing the eggshell, right? So this is four hydrogen, two carbon, two oxygen. Right. Your products are going to be calcium, acetate, and carbonic acid, I guess. So, take carbonic acid, oh, that's convenient. Alright, good. So, um, here you've got one calcium, two carbon, Three hydrogen, two oxygen. Here you've got one hydrogen, one carbon, and three oxygen. So the law of conservation of mass says that matter can't be created or destroyed. <coughs> we took that in our own words to be every atom that goes into a chemical reaction comes out the other side. Uh, what that means is you can't have, uh, let's see, we've got one carbon here and two carbons here, right, with three total carbons on the reactant side. Here we've got two carbons, so four carbons, three total carbons on the product side. That's good. If three carbon atoms go into a reaction, three carbon atoms better come out the other side. If that's not the case, you have to balance. Uh, here, I think we're already balanced, because we've got four hydrogens on this side, We've got three plus this one, that's four hydrogens on that side. I think we get every single thing balanced. But that's the purpose of balancing equations. If I had a different equation like this one, hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas, which are both homonuclear diatomic, makes water, which we're going to do a lab about that soon. Um, we don't see that to be the case. We know matter can't be created or destroyed, so we can't take two oxygen atoms and two hydrogen atoms and end up with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. That can't happen. Can't destroy an oxygen. So what we have to do is balance using coefficients. This is a coefficient. Oh. Uh, that means now I've got four hydrogens. See, two times two is four hydrogens. And two times one oxygen is two oxygens. Okay? Over here, now I've got two oxygens, which is good. They're the same. But I only have two hydrogens here and four over here. So I use a coefficient to make it four hydrogens. Now I've got four hydrogens here and four here, two oxygens here and two here. That means every atom that goes into the reaction comes out the other side. It's balanced. The law of conservation of mass is kept. Uh, the only thing that you are allowed to do when balancing a chemical equation is add coefficients. You can't change these guys or you're changing the literal chemical you're using. You can't change the little guys. You can only add coefficients. That's a key point for you guys as you go into this week. You can only balance with coefficients. So that worksheet has blanks for coefficients. The only other tidbit you need to know that you haven't been taught yet for that worksheet, if it has a little charge, like if you see something like this, or this, a little charge here, a little charge here. Uh, ignore that problem. Don't do the ones with the little charges. If you haven't learned ions yet, just ignore it. Although they're basically, I mean, balancing them is no different, but you don't have to worry about the little charges. You're not going to see those yet. Uh, if you have something like, I need a parenthesis, guys. So, 
Okay, so this, calcium hydroxide. See these parentheses here? That means everything inside the parentheses is affected by this subscript. Okay? That means you've got one calcium atom, two oxygens, and two hydrogens. Because this two affects everything in the parentheses next to it. So basically just parentheses are to simplify it. Yep, just like math, you would uh, break it up to calcium with two oxygens and two hydrogens. But nobody writes it that way, and I'll teach you why later. Sorry. Um, but, yeah, the, the, per, the parentheses make everything affected by that. But you are not allowed to change the subscript. You can only change the coefficient like that, or, you know, if need be, you can put 11 there, or 500, or whatever you need to put there. You won't put anything like 500, so maybe a few 11s could happen. So that's what you need to know about that worksheet and balancing equations. So review questions. Over right here, Kristen. So I still have a few minutes, right? Then after something? Four minutes. Uh, so review question one. If a substance can be physically separated into its components, is it a pure substance or a mixture? Mixture. Mixtures. Mixtures can be physically separated. Okay, if a substance can be given a single chemical name, like calcium bromide, are they, is it a pure substance or a mixture? Pure. pure substance can be given a chemical name. Uh, what element makes up the majority of the air we inhale? Nitrogen. And what makes up the majority of the air we exhale? So physical science had two test questions exactly like that this week. Um, so, and most of them got it, it was good. Um, but nitrogen doesn't react chemically with much, so most air is nitrogen. You breathe it in, uh, it comes right back out, your body doesn't use it, so whatever goes in comes out. Most air goes in as nitrogen, most air comes out as nitrogen, because be you don't use it. It would be carbon dioxide because that's a compound. No, um, <laughs> carbon dioxide makes up less than 1% of the air total, and so whatever you excrete as a waste product is still like a tiny fraction of a percent of the total volume of air. So, I mean, so but, like they're worried you could use that as kind of like process of elimination because, you know, it can't be like, I don't know. Oh, know what else, element? I think, You're right. I would, have, I would think that like, oh yeah, you breathe that, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide, but right. in carbon dioxide is that I never noticed that. Yes, nitrogen is and oxygen is, but we know nitrogen is like 78% of the air and oxygen only 21% of the air, and you use some of the oxygen, but there's always more nitrogen going in and out. I don't think you guys have that on the test, so that's kind of tricky, uh, but I'll check. Uh, where are we? So one type of phase change we didn't discuss is sublimation. Sublimation occurs when a solid changes directly to a gas without passing through the liquid phase. Does sublimation occur when something is getting heated or cooled? I didn't know the answer. I thought it was a trick question, so I put cool. Okay, it's not a trick question. Okay. Heated. Okay. <laughs> okay, so picture a brick of dry ice. It's almost Halloween and dry ice is like everywhere fogging up the world, right? Um, so when you pass by a brick of dry ice sitting at room temperature, the, the dry ice is solid carbon dioxide and it's very, very cold, much colder than regular ice. Um, and its boiling point is so low, because carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature, that it doesn't even turn into a puddle of liquid before it evaporates. It goes straight from solid to, um, to a gas because at room temperature it's already <laughs> past its boiling point. So it just woof, and it's a big soggy cloud uh, until it you know, spreads out into the room. So it goes from solid to gas, like that, that's sublimation. Anytime something goes from solid to liquid, it heats up. Anytime it goes from liquid to gas, it heats up. So straight from solid to gas is really, really, the particles are increasing greatly in kinetic energy. Solids just vibrating here, gases like all over here. Big increase in energy, so it's being heated. Energy is being added to each particle. Okay, Jolene. Uh, if a liquid goes through a phase change and you just know the molecules slow down and move closer together, what phase did it turn into? Solid phase. Solid. 
So a liquid that's slowing down and getting closer is going to be a solid. Uh, Jenny, what makes water an exception to the phase change rule? I can't find which questions we're okay. We're on review question seven. Okay, water. So when it slows down and becomes a solid, do its molecules get closer together? I know, I copied your stuff upside down and backward, and your whole notebook is all that stuff. Maybe you should move on until I find it. Nope, you have to answer. Okay. Uh, three. Four. Four. Here, this is it. Right here, it's upside down right here. Oh. <laughs> See? It's right here on number seven. No, actually, I am never going to take those up to use them as a 